on this edition of Native Report. We learn why treaties matter at a fascinating historic exhibit. We visit the official repository of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians. And we take a closer look at how Native nations are crucial to the national climate assessment. We also hear from the elders and learn something new about Indian Country on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Metwakanton Sioux Community, the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. The treaty-making era between the United States and Native nations resulted in hundreds of formal documents. Yet, there are many who question why these treaties still exist. In Minnesota, an exhibit attempts to answer the question, in why treaties matter. On this summer day, visitors to the Boys Fort Heritage Center are viewing Why Treaties Matter, one of two traveling exhibits exploring treaties signed between the Native Nations in Minnesota and the federal government. The idea developed out of a conversation at a previous Minnesota Indian Affairs Council meeting in which uh, we had a meeting with the uh, a National Museum of the American Indian uh, and Kevin Gover uh, was present uh, as well as some of his staff and we talked about how do we get the message out about understanding sovereignty and Indian tribes and we had to look at the foundation, the foundation of the relationship and the sovereign status between governments and tribes was the treaties that were signed between the United States of America and the individual sovereign Indian nations and so we wanted to go to the, to the foundation of that and uh, we talked about the treaty exhibit and fortunately we're at where we are today. I think people have to understand that if we respect the U.S. Constitution, uh, Section 1, Article 8 of the U.S. Constitution states in there that, that sovereign nations uh, are other governments, uh, the U.S. governments, the individual states, and Indian nations. So it's very important that that treaty uh, specifically recognize the U.S. Constitution and, and uh, the U.S. Constitution also spells that out. Uh, so treaties are alive today and it was the sole purpose of these treaties uh, to uh, allow the governments who are here first, which are Indian nations and who have always governed themselves to, it respects that, uh, it respects that relationship. In addition to the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, of which Chairman Lisi is also president, and the National Museum of the American Indian, the Minnesota Humanities Center is a third partner in an exhibit unique in its community-based approach. The Why Treaties Matter exhibit, boy, it, um, it really started with the, um, the legacy funding out of the state of Minnesota, which um, is a constitutional amendment which spe specifies a certain amount of arts and cultural funding each year. So the, the Humanity Center of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council received funding to create collaborative programming, new programming that would serve the state. And it was really the, the vision of the Minnesota Indian Affairs Board and, and Chairman Lacey to do something uh, like referential with this, um, do something that had really never been done before. It took quite a while, it took about a year to put together uh, we collaborated with the various Indian nations in Minnesota and uh, researched some of the uh, individual because, uh, you know, tribes are also individual governments and uh, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council is just a council uh, represented by Indian nations. Uh, so we want to get the individual 
story because they're sovereign distinct governments. So we wanted to get the individual story, put it in a collective uh, and get the overall theme of, of treaties and, and, and the sovereignty of Indian nations in there. We made about, we being the program team that really pulled this together, the program team was made up, um, I had the honor of serving on it, and then there were um, staff from Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, staff from the National Museum, um, and we made, if we totaled up um, 35 to 40 visits to the 11 sovereign nations um, of Minnesota. Um, first were exploratory, second we might have gotten more information from a tribal elder or knowledge keeper, and then the third visit on average um, we actually looked at the text that was being written. So a lot of information is collected um, and then sent to the writers and editors who um, the National Museum really put the panels together. Um, and it was important, I think, the, the board and the staff at the Humanities Center and the program team, um, and certainly the Indian Affairs Council, wanted all the nations to feel like they were represented um, and their voice could be heard. And that's not necessarily an easy task when you only have 20 panels and 200 words. More than 17,000 Minnesotans in 34 counties experienced the exhibit, which received an award from the Federation of State Humanities Councils. We have two traveling exhibits that travel all over the state of Minnesota. And we uh, represent uh, the treaty exhibit at different, uh, not only tribal uh, governments, uh, but also uh, individuals, uh, nonprofits, other museums, um, and as well as the state capitol, uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, just so people have a better understanding of uh, the treaties themselves. Generally speaking, the feedback we've gotten from both Dakota and Ojibwe and um, tribes across Minnesota have been, has been really strong. I think there are two, at least two audiences for this. Uh, the, for the, if you will, the non, say a non-enrolled member or a, um, just a, a Minnesotan who's not enrolled in one of the, the nations, almost feeling ripped off, like why didn't anybody tell me? I had no idea um, about this nation to nation relationship. I, I didn't under, I didn't, no one told me about the, the nations prior to U.S. Um, if you will, settlement um, and U.S. conquering of this land, that there were nations here prior to that, and that their exercise of sovereignty has been consistent from, from the beginning of time in this, in this place. So I think, one, why didn't anybody tell me? It would have, I would, it would have been nice to know. Um, and for uh, enrolled members, I think particularly students, I know this is where um, we've heard a lot from the Indian Affairs Board, we want our students to understand um, these rights, what we had to do to secure these rights and reserve these rights, and that our future is based on the proper exercise of these rights. The exhibit may come full circle with a possible showing at the National Museum of the American Indian. We're looking at plans to have the, the exhibit actually travel to Washington, D.C., to the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, and there may be uh, an opportunity for this uh, to be showcased there as well as maybe even looking at a national exhibit on, on, on Indian treaties. We're really excited about this exhibit that, that travels all over uh, the state of Minnesota to create a better understanding uh, between Indians and non-Indians and to you know hopefully uh, open up uh, a new dialogue here in Minnesota uh, re with respect to one another. Did you know that Idol No More is a protest movement among the Aboriginal peoples of Canada? Some First Nations are reacting to alleged abuses of Indigenous treaty rights. The founders of Idol No More outlined the goals of their movement in a press release in which they noted, the vision revolves around Indigenous ways of knowing rooted in Indigenous sovereignty to protect water, air, land, and all creation for future generations. The movement takes particular issue with approximately 10 bills in the Canadian Parliament. The leaders of Idle No More assert that this legislation threatens treaties and their indigenous vision of sovereignty. The methods of Idle No More range from flash mobs to blocking highways and to one tribal leader who went on a hunger strike. The Canadian Prime Minister has now indicated a willingness to consult with First Nations on environmental issues and legislative matters that impact Aboriginal peoples.
Next, the culture and heritage of the Mohican Nation is preserved for future generations. Thanks to public documents preserved forever in official depository on the Stockbridge Muncie Reservation. On this warm summer afternoon, while visitors to the Arvid E. Miller Library Museum are viewing the various displays, Nathalie Christensen recalls why there was such a need for a facility. It was built between 76 and 77. I think it started being built in 76, but then it was here in 77. The lady that, she lived up on the hill here, and she, her husband was um, a tribal president for 26 years so she was saving his papers and um, they had a fire at their house and the community all chipped in and they got the papers out and then they stored it in a, um, a tent until they got this built. Then our, our president um, Jack Miller he said that he could get, a, get us a library but he didn't know if he could pay the light bills. So some of the elder ladies, they sold um, aluminum cans and they had a wood stove in here that they had to come in and make a fire. And um, it sure has changed. The farmer president Christensen referred to is Arvid E. Miller. The museum may be small, but the collection of items is quite large and of great historical importance. Some are centuries old. It's sort of like a research library. It's anything we can find about our tribe. Old books, anything that was written about our tribe. And it's very, very, um, there's a lot of materials there. And we just got a new database where um, we're hoping it make things easier to find because you can have all the materials in the world and they're useless if you can't find, find them. So this will help find information for researchers and our visitors that are interested in our tribe. It's always exciting. Someone comes in looking for their relatives and sometimes even after they leave we're still looking or trying to help them do their research. This was an exhibit that was done a couple years ago and a lot of people are unaware that we're from New York and um, we had the kids tell the story about our removals. Um, until we got here in Wisconsin. If you push one of the buttons, it'll, they'll talk and tell you about our tribe at that location. This is probably our most precious gift. It was given to our tribe by the Prince of Wales in 1745. Christianity was always important to our tribe. We always had churches and schools. And um, I think that's why this is so significant to our tribe because it's we were probably one of the first Indians to get Christianized. Saw it as a better way of living. And, but by getting Christianized, we lost a lot of our culture and our language. Some of our young people are trying to bring the language back, but um, they have a hard time getting grants in that because we don't have a, a speaker. Um, a teacher from Canada has been coming down in the summer and staying a couple weeks in teaching the Muncie language. But some are saying, you know, they're not Muncie, they're Mohican, so I'm open to either one. I think um, it's important, language is important not to limit yourself. You know, you can speak more than one language. A room full of portraits is what Christensen describes as the most important part of the museum. These are our elders, and they watch over a lot of these meetings in this room, and they give you get a lot of strength from them. They've, most of them have gone on and usually everybody that comes in here can tell a story about one of these people and I think that's their connection. I think this is what really brings the museum down to earth, you know, is our elders. This is my grandmother and grandfather. Um, she was sort of a medicine woman. This is her sister. They were both sort of medicine women. And my grandpa, he drove a bus. And this is my mother, Leona Bowman. She's um, 92 years old. She's still living. And this is my Aunt Berga. And this is my Uncle Gordon. They um, come from a family of 16. 
There's one set of twins. So that's my family. Christensen and her staff are trained in how to properly archive materials. Items not on display are stored away from the main exhibit floor. Each item has a number. And so if we want to look them up, you know, we don't want to open the cabinet and look it up. Look, we look for that number. Every object has its own identification number. And we try to have its own tray so that it has its own home. And it's easier to handle it, you know, otherwise you're handling the object. People don't even realize we have almost all these objects put on um, in a database so that people can come and look and see what because before they never knew what was down here. And then if there's something that they see that they want to see in person, then we can bring it down and show it to them. I think working for your tribe is important too. You know, I think that makes me feel good when I see tribal. I sort of feel like I work for the community, you know, that um, if someone comes in from the community, it's my job to make them feel like this is their building. I think, and it's my firm belief, as I, uh, my firm belief is that second language learners who are committed to the proposition of language survival and maintenance will ensure that the languages don't die. So I would not throw up my hands in horror and start sort of, you know, singing uh, my laments or all my dirges to the dead, but in fact start doing something about keeping it alive by going to another generation. The language will change inevitably. It can't help but change because people coming into the language are coming from another culture linguistically and they would all be speakers of English. And the thinking in English, which they used to, will dominate the way they think in Ojibwe or Maori or any other language. It's up to us, the speakers, to, to ensure that in fact that is minimal rather than, than the maximum style of language. And that's my cracking my whip, that's why I crack my whip, that sort of thing. You do not say that. This is, you're speaking Maori, not speaking in English. Um, the complete transfer of idea to the, from one to the other doesn't always work. Um, and when it comes to, in our case, where cultural imperatives such as oratory in the formal situation is still a very demanding part of our culture for the sake of the tribe and its reputation, you must have good orators. And this generation now is wanting to be one of those orators. But then it demands a command of language which is, which is, out of the, which is above the ordinary. And a good command of mythology, Proverbs, style, all those sorts of things are a mark of a good orator. The climate is changing and Native nations across Indian country are feeling the effects. One tool helping leaders prepare for resource and infrastructural challenges is the National Climate Assessment. What exactly is this assessment and how can it help Native nations? Downtown Lincoln, Nebraska might not be the hot spot in the climate change debate, but on this day at the National Congress of American Indians Mid-Year Conference, a draft of the National Climate Assessment is being discussed. More and more in the face of growing and mounting climate change, we're just not really prepared. And this whole process is a way of beginning to look at how might we be better prepared to deal with these changes coming. We uh, just completed a three-hour session looking at um, uh, the National Assessment on Climate Change. This is the first time tribes have been officially invited to participate in the national and then up to the international IPCC process of um, looking at the impacts of climate change, the, the vulnerabilities that tribal lands have, uh, what are the um, key vulnerabilities, and one of them is indigenous knowledge, uh, something that is carried in the culture by the elders, passed on over the generations, but it includes information on local environments that can in some cases go back 
40,000 years. Um, any, any tribe that's existed today has been here for thousands and thousands of years and they've become seasoned cultures. So they've got knowledge and techniques and skills that they can bring to the table. We're engaging with Native American communities to really understand better some of the information needs in way of forecasting of climate um, events, um, looking at ways that uh, we can enhance their preparedness for extreme events, which are occurring at a higher frequency um, today than in the past, as well as understanding how they're currently dealing with some of these um, climate-related stresses and how actually some of the, the communities are actually in a forward way are developing adaptation strategies that might be useful to other rural communities across the Great Plains. Skeptics may disagree with the concept of climate change, but for the people who are witnessing dramatic changes firsthand, the evidence is compelling. But what we're seeing is in a rise of the water, the freshwater lens that is so critical in Pacific Islands for agriculture, for just, just drinking water, for livelihood, it's shifting, it's changing. So Pacific Islands do not have river estuaries. The contact point are ankylene ponds. Ankylene ponds are these upwellings of brackish water that happen between the freshwater and the saltwater lens. These ponds become critical for raising food, fish, uh, the local um, kind of fauna that is endemic to Hawaii. Those ponds are moving now with the rise in sea level. Those areas are changing. We've had a lot of impacts, you know, um, the forest uh, has been a big one. Um, we've had a lot of beetle kill. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned in the meeting earlier was that we've had stretches of land, you know, um, you know hundreds of square miles of, of uh, land that's basically been decimated by these spruce bark beetles. And uh, that, you know, results in wildfires, also increases the temperature in the rivers. And, you know, as these rivers temperatures are going up, we see less and less salmon and fish coming back to spawn. And so that, you know, affects our subsistence uh, lifestyle. You know, we uh, heavily depend on salmon, king salmon specifically, to, to live in Port Yukon. And, um, you know, they've been uh, in declining numbers every year now for, for quite a while. The National Climate Assessment fulfills an executive order that was completed in 2001 and again in 2009, but neither assessment included the views of Native nations. The tribal chapter for the 2013 National Climate Assessment, however, has been developed with input from over 250 tribal representatives. The meeting today was focused specifically on climate change assessments. Previously, in, 2000, in the year 2000 and 2009, there, there was not a tribal chapter. Tribes were left completely out of the National Climate Assessment. And so what we've done today is we brought a number of different people together, all together at the table, and we listened to the Native voice. I've seen this movement where we've had a good uh, number of people saying, we need to be at the table, we need to be at the table, we need to be at the table. And now we are at the table. I remember when people first started talking about this maybe about 10, 15 years ago and a climate researcher came to our village and he asked my father, you know, his elder, he, he asked him, well, you know, uh, what's going on with the climate and, and you know, so forth. And my dad looked at this, this uh, block of wood that he had cut and said, well, it says it all right there, you know, and he kind of was like, what more do I need to explain to you? And the progression that we saw was in that block of wood, but the researcher didn't really understand that, was that at the beginning, you had 100 years of growth and the tree was about this big around, its first 100 years of being alive. The rings were all compact and everything. That second 100 years turned into a tree this big, okay? But then, in its last few years, it died of being a beetle, from beetle kill, from drought and from beetle kill. And so if you look at, like around here, I guess how would it impact people in Nebraska? How, what does that mean to people in the Midwest? Well, we saw the longer growing, growing season too, a long time ago, you know, 100 years ago. But now it turned into drought, it turns into beetle kill, it turns into massive uh, fires, those kinds of things. I think the primary focus point that the indigenous cultures worldwide and specifically Hawaiians have to offer is the idea that relationships matter. The idea that the relationships we have
to the natural world, our relationship to the cosmos, our relationship to each other as human beings, and our relationship, probably most importantly, to ourselves, how we see our fit in this great surround of life is fundamental to shaping our behavior. So in Hawaii, we don't control natural resources. We don't even talk about them in those terms. These are our relatives. These are natural relationships that we have. I think what we're suggesting from Hawaii is this might be the moment where we would think about engaging in a different way. And that might lead to some real solution building. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org and on Facebook. Thank you for spending time with us here at Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. We'll see you next time. Stacy Thunder is a member of and legal counsel for the Red Lake Nation. And Tad Johnson is a member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and is chair for the American Indian Studies Department on the campus of the University of Minnesota Duluth.